Yeah, okay, you're listening to Edge Radio, and this is... <laughs> Me- media Mothership. Little tingle there to get us going. Because, uh, of course, the um, um, music player I've got does autoplay for the next... <laughs> Uh, but yes, this is Media Mothership with Dr. Craig Norris, joined by B.A. Zeke. Hello. Oh, and I'll, I'll put your mic on, I guess. Oh, yeah, I'd put... So now now you're, um, you're mic'd up. There you go. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> I'm great. It's glad to be here. I'm glad up- to be here. Yeah, you've been upgraded. So uh, Media Mothership. On Media Mothership, we look at how media frames the world around us, bizarre, uh, unusual phenomena, uh, interesting things that might be occurring and unusual events. So today's story is what we're going to cover a little bit on Pokemon, mm-hmm. just to kind of whet the appetite, it's like a starter meal. Yeah, like a and... happy meal. <laughs> <laughs> That's spot on! Because yeah. it is actually McDonald's referenced Happy Meal. Incidental, not sponsored. Yeah. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about Poke- a big Pokemon scandal hitting McDonald's. And then we're going to look at, uh, uh, as we looked at last week, this idea of how media can shape the world around us. And we're going to discuss uh, crime. Crime, the way crime, in particular the mafia, are represented in media. Uh, let's start, though, by having a first look at this outrageous, outrageous news story posted on Kotaku recently. Headlined, McDonald's Pokemon card Happy Meals are back. But fans aren't happy. Uh, have you ever uh, had a Pokemon um, Happy Meal in life? Oh, Zeke? yeah, in life I think I have. Uh, I've had Happy Meals, obviously, when I was a kid. Um, nothing against people who have Happy Meals when they're not a kid, but it's just my personal experience. Um, I've had... I don't think I've ever gotten Pokemon trading cards out of it. I think they're always like the little figures. That's or right. Like on a little Pokeball or something like that. So the story is uh, going on about how um, many adult Pokemon fans, adult being the important word for this story, many adult Pokemon fans were let down as they found basketball toys inside their kids' meals. Mm. Well, do you have any suspicions as to where this story might be going? Uh, LeBron James? Is that- <laughs> <laughs> well, it is linked to Space Jam 2. So as we know, Happy Meals 2, as you were describing them, often feature a toy. Now, the logic behind the Happy Meal is fascinating to me. It's a bit like a Kinder Surprise mm. in terms of you purchase this object. It could be a Kinder Surprise, which is a chocolate egg, and within the chocolate egg is this little toy. But financially, your, your financial exchange is, on the surface it appears, to buy an edible product. Right, Happy Meal, you're buying maybe a hamburger and some chips and a drink. Uh, For a Kinder Surprise, you're buying the chocolate egg. And there just happens to be this this extra piece of material there in that purchase, right? The Happy Mm. Meal would have like a toy uh, coinciding usually with a movie that's happening at that time. Uh, the Kinder Surprise will just have a random bit of plastic toy. Yeah. Uh, now, what's interesting to me about the logic of it, many people begin to pivot away from the actual thing you're buying, that is the the meal, towards what's meant to be just the extra value thing, the little toy. And it completely flips the logic of what you're engaged in there. That, that really, what is the mothership? Mm. As we ask on this show, what is the mothership of that experience? Is it the hamburger or is it the toy? Mm. And in the case of this Pokemon article, the mothership actually is the Pokemon cards, right? In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if many people purchase the Happy Meal, throw away (laughs) the burger and chips, don't eat it, and just want those, I don't know, three or four cards... Uh, and it turns out, indeed, this is the case, that uh, where this outrage is coming from is that... I think this is in the States. I know it's run in Australia once where they had these Pokemon cards. Mm-hmm. So as you know, Pokemon like, it takes many forms, but this form that we're looking at is the kind of OG Pokemon form, the Mothership Pokemon form, which is the card game. Yeah. And so uh, uh, in, this, in this sense, people are, are buying the Happy Meal to get these cards... And complaints are coming through that many people, when they get their Happy Meals home, 
to sell their Pokemon cards on eBay are uh, really outraged that they've just got Space Jam 2 toys. Mm, yeah. And it turns out that um, this promotion, which was mo- supposed to come with a Pokemon spinner toy and a cardboard Pokemon Pikachu toy, a uh, coin, oh. and a pack of four cards. So it sounds like there's a lot there in, in the US. Uh, actually, instead, uh, um, hasn't been supplied and they're just recycling through old toys uh, from previous Happy Meals that, that never sold. Now, the thing is, for kids, it's one thing as a parent to have a kid who's left unsatisfied that they mm. didn't get their Pokemon toy. Uh, but it's another thing when it's an adult that's, I don't know, fantasizing of the millions they'll make online selling these cards. And, you know, it's not too out of the ordinary the, when, when it turns out when this... When this deal was ran ran before, indeed, many people were scalping these cards. They mm. were quite collectible, and they were selling them for outrageous sums on eBay. Um, the thing that does bring some delight to me in a Marxist sense, maybe, in terms of exposing the use value versus exchange value paradox here, is that these collectors have been done out of or have revealed the brutal truth of what their exchange is about. The wasteful exchange. Mm, that's true. <laughs> that it's not about the meal, right? There's no discussion about was the burger nice. It's all about the fact that this was really all about the peripheral object. That was the fantasy. This, and you know, isn't that life? Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes, <isn't> that, <laughs> if I could go out on a boat, that's kind of you know, many people would say that's the the American dream in some ways. That it's this kind of, you know, you you you're racing around thinking you need this perfect job or something, and and all the while, what are you really wanting mm. in life? Is it the chocolate Kinder Egg, or is it actually that you've been sold this idea that uh, the chocolate you know egg is just to get the toy that you? That's really true. Want? Yeah. Uh, yeah, some people, yeah, some people, um, you know, maybe don't really understand what their real craving is. Mm. Right? Clearly, they're not craving. Yeah, and there's been, I know, uh, uh, in Japan, I've been told there was a similar phenomena with, uh, I think it was, um, uh, again, a kind of toy, it was kids, a toy, th- uh, I think it was cards mm. that was sold with gum. And gum was the thing that was being sold here. Right? You buy these gum sticks. Or maybe it was chocolate. Anyway, you'd buy, let's say chocolate. You'd buy the chocolate and it had cards within it. And kids were just buying these things and throwing the chocolate away for the cards. And it caused this kind of, you know, middle yeah, class crisis is, of wastefulness. Yeah, that is interesting because, I got to know, as a kid in primary school, I remember, I don't know if you remember the, those sort of like kind of, I don't know if it's holographic or whatever, the like AFL cards that come in chips. Um... I can't remember exactly what they are or what they're called or whatever, but they you come in those little um, snack bag of chips. Yep. And then, like, so people would take them, have them at school or buy them from the, uh, oh, no, I can't remember what it's called, the canteen. Um, and it, it always seemed like it was a big thing at, obviously, in, like, one grade of my school. The next year it was nothing. But in that year it was like, oh, that's everything. And I never really cared. Now that I look back at it, I'm like, I didn't really care about because I think you get different flavors and maybe like whatever else. I didn't really care about what flavor it was. It's more just about getting the different cards. I mean, yes. like, oh, I've got this one, I've got this one, oh, I've got these many, I'll trade that with you and this and that. And it was more, it definitely was about those AFL cards more than, I don't even remember what that, see, this thing, I don't remember what the brand is. I remember the, the little things, they were AFL branded things with the footy players on them, but I don't remember the brand of chips that actually did it. So, I, I thank you for that confession, Z. <laughs> We, we, will, we will have a five-minute confession on every show yeah. as we confess to the guilty sins we did immediate. But that is exactly the experience we're looking at here. The, mm. the moment which the, um, the mothership, so the chips, right, is what is being bought and sold here. But it's the, uh, in this case, the AFL card. Is it, yeah, was it a card? Yeah, it was just like a little, a little um, plastic card that had the player on it and some stats and whatever else, yeah. And, and that is where the value lies in it the the card mm. itself not the the product and again yeah that just fascinates me in mm. terms of the what is the value being exchanged there uh, a normal capitalist 
theory would just say, you know, you're buying uh, a, a product that's needed to satisfy a, a need, but but when when you're buying the product not to satisfy its surface need, that is, you need chips because you are hungry, but instead you're buying the product because you've developed this unhealthy addiction to AFL cards. Yeah. Sorry, I shouldn't put judgmental values into. But anyway, you've you've really started to want those AFL cards. You've yeah. What what what's the cost there? Yeah. Well, uh, talking talking of cost. So that's just a little bit of news that's happened. Um, where I want to take us now is into exposing more myths. You know, I, I think we're doing a bit of. Um, oh, I was about to say myth busting. That name's <laughs> been taken. Uh, we're doing a little bit of expose work here. So uh, what I want to explore now is this great little article on crack.com uh, called Hollywood Myths Cracked, Four Things About Mobsters We Believe Because of Movies and Shows. So this is a, a piece that's looking at TV shows and movies which have represented mafia, uh, the mafia culture and have, for many people that aren't part of the mafia, really defined who the mafia are. Hmm. Which isn't surprising. I mean, should we be surprised that people don't know the reality of the mafia when they're not the mafia? Yeah, exactly. So, so let's not feel bad about yeah. <laughs> the fact that, that I myself thought these things we're about to talk about, these four things, were all realities, hmm. that they've been completely exposed as wrong. Fortunately, I've never had to meet the mafia hmm. and draw upon these myths and show that I was completely out of place. Uh, but if I do, now I know better because uh, what we'll talk through are, uh, some of these four examples. We'll show, we'll play some short clips of the movies uh, that are really symbolic of the type of um, uh, incorrectness of, yeah. of mafia. And actually, where this story started for me was uh, last weekend I was watching Top Gun, the original mm -hmm. 84, whenever it came out, Top Gun. And. Um, I was reading on IMDb the trivia, and there was this great little quote from during the production. I'll read the quote saying, During a break in the filming of the hangar scene, um, so Top Gun involves planes on an aircraft carrier. Yeah. <laughs> so there's a hangar. Uh, a group of naval officers being used as extras approached Tony Scott, the director of the film, and complained about the unrealistic unre collection of patches on the flight suits of the actors. Right, so obviously, uh, they were filming. I, I guess actually, this was yeah in a in a military hangar, and the extras as well as the navy officers there were getting annoyed of these inaccuracies. Right, in that sense, it was the the little um, colourful patches that were appearing on the uh, uniforms of the actors mm -hmm. playing flight pilots. So they complained, and this is great. This is where I think this all sums up this mafia movie yeah. world. So Tony Scott replied to these Navy officers, and paraphrasing uh, this point goes on to say, we're not making this movie for Navy fighter pilots. We're making it for Kansas wheat farmers who don't know the difference. Mm. So today we're all Kansas wheat farmers yep. that don't know the difference between the reality of the mafia and its media portrayal. And that's the logic behind which many of these films were made, right? They were made yeah. not for the mafia to watch and enjoy. They were made for a mainstream demographic audience, in that sense, maybe the Kansas wheat farmer, mm. who doesn't know the difference between the reality and fiction. So let's cut Hollywood a break. Mm. They don't get enough of a break. Exactly. Well, yeah, and sometimes um, I've heard some directors for movies saying like, oh, we would have done it this other way that's correct, but we don't have the time. So they need to cut it down. They need to have that, that time slate of two hours or two and a half hours, and they need to get everything in. They need to have the story, the, the yep. beginning, middle, end. They need to have it all happen, conclusion, go home. And they can't do that if they make everything accurate. Yeah, and I've heard, uh, and again, we'll explore over the next few weeks examples of this where um, the reality wouldn't be believed by the audience. Right. They, they've been fed that myth of what occurs so often that if you don't play to that trope, then the audience will say this is not realistic, mm. <laughs> ironically, or this is not satisfying, right? It, the story should go in this direction. Mm. All right, so let's, let's start with number four. So the number four myth in this article is that if you're a rat, you're dead. Yep. So what's the rat 
uh, uh, narrative in in a in rat this mafia is story. somebody who is a part of the mob or was used to be a part of the mob or something like that. They have some affiliation with the uh, mob or mafia or whoever, and they are approached or they approach law enforcement or federal agents or whatever, and then basically work out a deal with them to spy and give secrets to uh, the federal agents or the police or everything to then eventually lead to an arrest or something like that or a bust uh, of the mafia or mob or whatever it is in question. That's right, yeah. So you, you, you've, you've ratted them out. Mm. So you've queued up this, found this great clip from The Sopranos. Yep. So in this scene, Tony, uh, the mafia boss that we've seen, so The Sopranos was a TV series. It was a highly acclaimed TV series that features a, uh, a kind of mafia family in the US. So in this scene, Tony kills Fabian Petrullio. Mm. Uh, who has been writing out. So uh, we'll see this is, again, the fictional representation of a, uh, of a grizzly uh, rat being found out. Must be something we could do. Tony, it's Tony, you fuck. You know how much trouble you're in now? You took an oath and you broke it. I could have killed you last night outside the motel. Your daughter was drunk, remember? I was there in the parking lot. I had a gun, but I didn't do it. Because of her, I told myself, it's just a coincidence. Taking this little girl college. You know, one thing about us wise guys, the hustle never ends. You shot me at that motel, your life would have been flushed on a piece of dude. Please, honey, I'm begging. <coughs> Jimmy says hello from hell, you fuck. <laughs> All right. Well, it wouldn't be a mafia movie without some F bombs. Sorry, I know you'd uh, queued it up so carefully to avoid well, it's vet- some F bombs. All these but, clips, uh, they're so hard to. There's, they're littered everywhere, you know? <laughs> and it's hard to get. A clean clip, clip. as it were. Yeah, but that was my fault. You had queued it up so nicely, and I I, uh, I um, missed it by seconds on each side, it seems wonderfully. <laughs> so anyway, in that scene, yeah, Tony Soprano clearly has found the rat and is now doing, as we all want, as Mafia watches, uh, now extracting uh, revenge. Uh, and, of course, what's interesting about this is that um, the article goes on to point out that the tro- this trope of the rat always dies in the mafia is indeed based on an old-school southern Italian code of silence called omerta. Mm-hmm. Uh, apologies for my mispronunciation. Um, you know, that, is, that does exist and that is used today, uh, but it has long since been abandoned, they say, in the U.S., and it's not an automatic death sentence if you do rat out the mafia. Uh, the article goes on to point out, obviously, that if this was the case, you know, if it was the reality that any rat of the mafia is immediately killed or killed within a, a some t- you know, you know, time yeah. scale, um, you wouldn't have the various ex-mafia people that have podcasts now mm. or that are on various YouTube clips demystifying Mafia's representation of uh, uh, um, in, in cinema. Uh, it goes to point out on a number of, of actually uh, rats who are making quite a bit of money. Uh, there's the former hitman, Frank Colota, who gives tours in Las Vegas and consults on Hollywood movies. He was previously a rat. So, again, um, you know, this myth isn't about saying that informants and snitches aren't going to be under threat and aren't going to have their life kind of uh, threatened. But nevertheless, it's not an automatic one, as happens yeah. in many of these representations, where immediately it will involve a, um, a kind of uh, death. Yeah. And I mean, um, I think in writing a screenplay and everything, obviously there isn't a nugget of truth there, because obviously, this is, obviously I suppose it, it used to be a death sentence, um, and also in... Italy, particularly in Sicily, um, I suppose this still happens or is like a thing that has some yeah, basis there, is... there. Yeah, so you can take that and it's an interesting thing to add to your script, particularly when they didn't, uh, like before the saturation of gangster movies and mafia movies and everything, to have like, oh, he's a rat, he's an informant. What happens to them? They'll get killed. Then you have the yep. body Second and act. you go, what happens to that? The enforcement are going, what happened to them and this? And a, yeah, 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 yeah. Nice, a nice point to... to um, have in the movie to let everything sort of start happening or yeah yeah there's tons i mean donnie brasco um also involves many examples of like the 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 figure of the rat um and how that trope is is played out in films 
Uh, the third example they mention in this uh, series is the contemporary mobsters are less violent than they used to be. Uh, so this is an idea, of course, that if you're watching a uh, mafia movie, uh, often there'll be a massive shootout scene. Mm. Right? You know, uh, so many movies, just Sopranos have it, um, where there'll be a face-off between the ma- you know gangs or mafia or police. And there'll be a lot of violence that'll be uh, going on. And, you know, the idea being that they're they're highly exaggerated. And the article goes on to say that um, while many gangster movies are full of, um, you know, these kind of violent scenes, it's it's not the case that most... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's an everyday practice, mainly because the mafia are trying to avoid going to jail. Yeah. Right? I guess the idea be that you don't want to attract too much heat to yourself, as would, would happen in these huge shootouts in the films that are seen, and and they're not quite as 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 common. So uh, uh, there's a quote here from um, uh, one uh, a guy previously associated with the mafia. Franzessa, who says, um, you know, this is to quote him, let me tell you, unfortunately, there were people in our life like that, you know, who were hyper-violent. Um, he goes on to say that Roy DeMio, who was in a different crew, had a very serious bad reputation for killing people, chopping up bodies, putting them in drums and things like that. So it's an individual thing. You're never taught that this is how you have to take care of something. But there are people that went to that extreme. So again, saying, you know, there are certainly individuals for whom there would be a lot of violence that they, put, that they do, but in the, uh, the training of being a mafia person, you're not trained. <laughs> I guess yeah, I think there was a quite an, it must maybe be further in the article or something, but they were talking about generally, obviously, they don't want as many um, bodies in that as well because they're actually just really expensive to deal with. They become like a monetary problem. They're like, if you kill someone, yeah, you have to get rid of it. Also... That's a crime. <laughs> so you gotta... you're going to attract heat. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So Now, the next one we have a few clips uh, for, which is such a common occurrence in mafia films uh, that crime deals are an event where everyone shows up. Right? So there's always that scene in a movie where all the various mob individuals, you know, the heads and so forth, all show up at a venue, and they sort out um, what's going on. So, uh, you know, The Departed, Bugsy, uh, analyze this, Mm. uh, and, of course, the Joker scene from Dark Knight all feature moments where all of the uh, mafia heads are collected together in a room and they're doing some exchange or they're planning their next move. Uh, well, before we go into demystifying it, we'll play a few clips. Here's um, the Joker's pencil trick scene from The Dark Knight 2008, which involves the mafia heads kind of all together. So again, you can picture it if you haven't seen it. Basically, uh, they're in a kitchen area and all of these different mafia heads are, mm. are together planning their moves. I thought my jokes were bad. Give me one reason why I shouldn't have my boy here pull your head off. How about a magic trick? I'm gonna make this pencil disappear. Ta-da! It's... It's gone. Oh, and by the way, the suit, it wasn't cheap. You ought to know, you bought it. That's it. I want to hear proposition. Let's wind the clocks back a year. These cops and lawyers wouldn't dare cross any of you. I mean, what happened? Did your, your balls drop off? Hmm? You see, a guy like me... Freak. A, a guy like me... Look, listen. I know why you choose to have your little... <clears throat> group therapy sessions in broad daylight. I know why you're afraid to go out at night. The Batman 
See, Batman has shown Gotham your true colors, unfortunately. Dent, he's just the beginning. And, and as for uh, the television's so-called plan, Batman has no jurisdiction. He'll find him and make him squeal. I know the squealers when I see them. And... What do you propose? It's simple. We uh, kill the Batman. <laughs> if it's so simple, why haven't you done it already? If you're good at something, never do it for free. How much you want? Uh, half. <laughs> so it's a great... I mean, I like that scene because you can see they're kind of... The bosses are all together. They're haggling over price. They're haggling over how it's going to happen. There's also a snitch scene. So we've got two tropes yeah. in one. I like that. It's like bingo. Mm. We should play um, Mafia Bingo after this. <laughs> you know, each time you get one of these. So we've got the snitch, yeah. right? So the Joker's identified uh, one of these, um, I think it's the Hong Kong crime boss, as a, as a snitch. He's going to snitch on us, right? Yeah. So he said, I know, I've seen my Mafia movies. I know the tropes yeah. of the snitch. And this character is performing all of those trope mm. spaces. So, yeah, he's seen the movies. And also... What we have here is they're all together basically planning uh, where these meetings can go on and and how these are, are, are kind of not not realistic portrayals. So I guess the um, the next scene we've got kind of starts demystifying this. Right? Yeah. And where I like the next what I like about the next clip is that it's from an undercover FBI agent fact-checking mob movies and TV. It's from Vanity Fair YouTube. And this is a general YouTube phenomenon where on YouTube you can find a whole set of experts watching movies critiquing yeah. the mistakes in them. So lawyers critique law movies. Yeah. Um, dentists, oh sorry, that's a, I don't know if there are dentists critiquing dentist movies, because I don't know if there are many dentist movies, but definitely... Oh, oh yeah, or they'll have like a dentist um, demystifying uh, dental scenes from movies, so it yeah. may not be a, den a dental movie, uh, they may not be doing the Tooth Fairy starring The Rock, but uh, they'll go, there'll be like a dental scene in a movie and then they'll... It's an odd example for me to have know. chosen. But yeah, I've seen <laughs> ones of, of, of a pilot uh, demystifying... Uh, aerial combat mm. scenes, um, a doctor uh, talking about a, an anime uh, that was explaining the human body. Mm. Um, yeah, and they're, they're actually a lot of fun to watch. I enjoy watching, like, so a swordsman demystifies mm. sword battles. Um, those are really fascinating. Mm. Anyway, so in this scene, what we've got is the movie, um, what is it, Departed. Uh, yeah, The Departed. And it's a scene where there's uh, one of these big gang meetings or mafia meetings going down. You've got the heads. Yeah, I think it's a it's a deal. This, well, this one's actually a deal because uh, there's two ones. There's when all the mafia heads come together and they talk business. Um, and then there's the other one where there's a deal that's going down and then you have like, I don't know, 50 people from each side coming to the deal <laughs> and like, yeah. yeah, going through it. And this one I think is the mob or mafia who I can't remember who they are, but um, doing a deal with the Chinese, I guess selling them like microprocessors or something. Yeah. Yep. So this scene starts with the FBI surveillance group yep. who are observing this deal going down. Yeah. And um, uh, what's great is you'll hear a little bit from the undercover FBI agent talk after this scene that we'll watch about where it goes wrong. Uh, so let's hear. We have a blind spot. Why do we have a blind spot? We had two hours notice. Two hours. F you think this is NASA? Well, it never crossed my mind. Have you got a camera in the back? What back? What they got right, for the most part, was the interaction within the command center or the monitoring room. It's chaos. The technical equipment doesn't function properly. Those are very common occurrences. That, unfortunately, is pretty much the main realistic part. I want to tell you, these two of these gents have machine guns. 
two dozen people show up for a major meeting, that just doesn't happen. Every person in that room is a potential informant down the road. If they're gonna hear and see everything you've done, you have to be prepared that they're gonna compromise you. In this case here, you had the mob boss and underlings. Well, only he and the main negotiator for the Chinese should have been there. You always see these meetings taking place in desolate warehouses or garages. That's not very accurate. If I have an important meeting, I'll have it in the lobby of the Park Plaza Hotel. You hide in plain sight. Did you put a cap? Yeah, look, so he, he manages to demystify. Uh, well, he, he agrees that the tension that occurs in those surveillance groups is kind of realistic. Mm. But then the, um, the, the reason why you wouldn't have a lot of mafia heads together is that there's a lot of people listening, mm. a lot of witnesses that can corroborate crimes. Yep. Because you've got them all together in the same room watching yeah, and hearing. Or even um, you wouldn't have a bunch of under... Like, people who don't have as much hierarchy within the system, they wouldn't just be there. Like, a random guy who does stuff, does errands on the street and stuff like that, he wouldn't be there because he doesn't need to be. And if he's there, he could be an informant, which actually Leonardo DiCaprio, who's in the movie, um, plays an informant and he's actually there... Yeah. In the scene. So he is actually, his character is doing the thing that you shouldn't do that for. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. That, that, yeah, you'd be a really bad mafia person for for falling into that, that um, you know, bringing someone in that doesn't need to be there. Because, uh, yeah, as the article points out, the, the problem is that the big meetings that are portrayed in a lot of movies with all the mafia heads is that it makes everyone involved super vulnerable uh, and as the clip we just heard talks about, um, uh, an event simply wouldn't happen like that because it just creates too many potential witnesses, let alone the logistics of organizing it would be just laughable. Uh, it's way easier. The, the clip goes on if you want to listen to it. Undercover FBI agent fact checks mob movies. He goes on to say it's, it's much easier for mob bosses just to meet on their own mm. uh, rather than everyone involved. Yeah. And obviously in a movie... The mob boss, if, especially if it's a mob movie and everything, it's obviously like a great cinematic moment, like a yeah. moment in the story to have everyone come together and then you can have, I don't know if it's, say, The Dark Knight or whatever, Batman could show up or, or yeah, as it was in that movie, Joker could show up and be like, oh, I've got a proposition for all of you and you just all happen to be here at the same time so I don't have to go to every single person individually. Which is, But that's what probably will happen because that is the more savvy secure thing to do so yeah it is interesting thinking of how a movie would not have the same impact because i liked his point at the end where he's saying that so look in reality um the trope of gangsters doing deals in like an abandoned warehouse or a remote location in the city is really unlikely he goes on to say that you know if, if he had an important meeting in this mafia context it'll be in the lobby of like a hotel and you'd hide in plain sight mm. But, you know, if you're doing your movie and you just have your mafia heads meeting at banjos, yeah. it kind of deflates. <laughs> yeah, or I think in some movies they will have them out at dinner or something. and Maybe it's a few less yeah. people, but they still have a lot of people, whereas it would be more likely to be um, two people, may maybe three, mm. instead of like a bigger crowd of people. Um, so that is a fun one, and I think, yeah, you, you see that so often. So the, the last one that they have is the one of mobsters don't take out law enforcement agents left and right. Obviously, in many mafia films, the key protagonists and antagonists are, you know, the, the law enforcement and the mafia, and so inevitably you have these battles or fights mm. where mobsters are, 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 uh, are fighting and often often police officers will, will get taken out. I've uh, got a couple of clips of films unpacking that. The first one we'll have is from the classic film Godfather and this is from a YouTube where an ex-mob boss rates 13 mafia movie scenes and this is him rating the scene in, in The Goodfellas Oh, sorry, Goodfellas, in Godfather, where the character, I think his name's Sonny. It's been mm -hmm. a long time since I've seen The Godfather. But he's gunned down in a uh, toll booth in his car as he gets to a toll yep. booth. So, again, uh, it's a really dramatic and violent scene where the gangsters have, uh, like, Tommy guns. Like, um, yeah, I think they're Tommy guns or uh, something. something machine gun type like weapons. Yeah. So it's very visually exciting, but our ex-mob boss unpacks that. This is 
this would never happen. First of all, there's too much work involved in this, you know? You've got so many guys, and uh, usually mob hits are not done like that. I mean, they're normally done at close range, small caliber guns and shotguns being used. I never saw anything like this before. I know back in the 20s they used machine guns. Tommy guns was the, was the term back then, but to me this scene seems to be unrealistic. All right, yeah, so we only gave that four Mafia oh. hats out of ten. Yeah, four Mafia hats. Godfather. Yeah. Godfather's a great film, but, uh, yeah, he considers that scene to be, yeah, just too ostentatious. Mm. Uh, the next clip we'll have a look at is from, uh, again, the undercover FBI agent fact checks mob movies and TV. Uh, and this is from, uh, do you know what movie this is from? This is the Al Capone movie. Um... I yeah, guess. no, I can't remember what it was called. He's looking at the Al Capone movie. Uh, da, 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 yeah, and uh, in this scene, yeah, we have we have the undercover FBI agent who is being interrogated as to uh, whether he's a snitch or not. Yeah. You know, Bannon, I make my number every week. Wow. There's a myth out there that if someone asks you if you're law enforcement while you're undercover, you have to answer in the affirmative. That's not... True, I've been challenged multiple times. The first time I was challenged, when somebody said, you're an FBI agent, I said, yeah, I'm J. Edgar Hoover. And he immediately started laughing and we went off and finished what we were doing because I just disarmed him with the, the humor. Maybe I'm a federal agent, maybe I'm a bigamist, maybe I'm a murderer on the run. Believe what you want, there's no way I can stop you. But that's not what matters now. It's not. When you're faced with a life or death situation, you probably want the bad guys to know that you are, in fact, law enforcement as opposed to a cooperator. That's a very effective technique because the bad guys, most criminals, at least sane criminals, don't want to kill law enforcement because if you kill a federal agent, the government's going to get you. Like he didn't say, don't kill me, I'm a federal agent, which is sometimes what the recommendation is. Okay, but he, he at least leaves them with that hint that they don't need that trouble. Probably the most realistic part of that exchange is when he asks to use the bathroom at the end because that's what you feel like after walking out of one of those places. Nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I think, I think he felt that that film was quite realistic in a way. And, you know, it, it is one of those kind of cliches that if someone asks you if you're a police officer and you're undercover, you have to tell them. It seems so ludicrous. I guess if there was, like, that's the thing. Like, I've heard that before, and it always seems... Ludicrous. <laughs> ludicrous to me, yeah. But, like, and if it wasn't, there'd be, like, a law or something for it. And people would go, well, here's the law. That's right. For it. But no, yeah, one, yeah, no yeah. one does it. Just go, that's just a thing. It's not... I mean, who would be an undercover person? Yeah. And why would case? the government want to make law enforcement tell people when they're undercover that they're law enforcement? Because why wouldn't you just walk up to everybody in your thing and to say, oh, are you law enforcement? <laughs> yeah, well, and, and, but uh, the, the frequency of the showdown scenes in mafia films uh, continues, so it's quite a trope. Uh, in that one of the mob boss, ex-mob boss rates 13 mafia films, he talks about how unpopular uh, taking out law enforcement is because simply it's bad for business. Mm. Uh, so the article goes on to say that these guys want to cut deals with those supposedly working on the side of the law. So, yeah, it's interesting here, right? So the Mafia's guy saying, look, it's it's not in their interest to to shoot or wound or kill law enforcement because it's bad for business, but also, yeah, they're, they're wanting to look for those people on that side of the law who could they could cut a deal with, right? Mm. So um, uh, if they kill a law official, not only it, does it close that door, but will probably result in a general outcry uh, to actually arrest those mobsters, uh, which is the one thing, of course, mobster types are trying to avoid. Uh, so, yeah, quite quite a cliche. But, yeah, it's, it's you know, if, if you want to while away the hours doing the dishes, doing a search for, uh, you know, rate, rating movie scenes or mafia, mm -hmm. you know, ex-crime boss rates movie scenes or demythologizes movies, it's quite interesting. Mm, it's really interesting. Yeah, I had to I had to look through both of the clips. Um, just obviously when I was trying to find those clips, and yeah, quite interesting all the different things that they go through. And I've watched a bunch of other ones for, um, you know, the, there's so many out there now. It's just a, a genre of thing on YouTube now. That you have this person demystifying this thing. So the expose will 
record ourselves reporting on is um, how movies get radio scenes wrong. Mm, that's right. <laughs> or we can do that. <laughs> I think there are a couple of movies that feature radio Yeah, I think there's... Uh, I don't know why this one immediately came to my head, but there was a movie, it must have come out a couple of years ago, about um, there was some sort of radio station on a boat. Right. And it's like in the middle of the sea or something, and they must be sending out the broadcast signal to maybe a country or something that's under... Um, like a regime of a of a dictator or something or something like that. I think it's based on a true story, but that immediately came into my head. I can't remember what it's called, but it, so there is one though that I know. Of. Well, there, there. Look, when I was an undergrad way back in 1990, there was a film called Pump Up the Volume, mm. American film starring Christian Slater, where he is a pirate radio broadcaster mm. in the states. So I think we can totally demystify that 1990s film yeah. uh, from our expert point of view as radio broadcasters. That's right. Uh, look, we might uh, just go to uh, one of my favorite things to do on the show, which is to play a Vox Pop. I have another Vox Pop from the uh, vaults of Taz Pop South 2022. Here, right. here we are talking with Shrek. That's right, all the way from far, far away. That's right. <laughs> So hi, I'm I'm here with three excellent looking guys, and uh, we're here at Taz Pop South. Um, can you tell me what your name is and if you're cosplaying as something? Well, my name's Oliver Messick, but I'm currently dressed as Shrek from Shrek. Yeah, you definitely are. I'm Thomas King, and I'm dressed as Speedwagon from Part One of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. Yes, and my name's Kat, and I'm dressed up as. I was trying to dress up as Joseph dressed up on part three of JoJo's. Yeah, great choices. They're all fantastic choices. I like the JoJo references in particular. Now, um, but Shrek, Shrek is life, man. This is a bit of an on-the-spot question. What's the first pop culture that comes to your mind right now? Mario. Mario? I was thinking, like, um, Dance Dance Revolution and stuff. I was thinking spaghetti, but I think... Pop culture currently, D and D maybe. D&D, nice choices. Um, okay, so what's been the biggest surprise you've had so far at Taz Pop South? I actually surprised the amount of people that shown up because I small country, so there's a lot of people and it surprised me. Yeah, that's what I was thinking too. About how many people were here, especially in the parade. Yeah, like what everyone else said and how well everyone has made their like costumes as well. That was pretty interesting. Yeah. Okay, so finally, um, this is a bit of a difficult question. Is there any Tasmanian pop culture? Is there anything specifically Tasmanian that you think is pop culture? Shrek? Uh, yeah. I mean, Shrek's life. <laughs> that doesn't, that, that counts, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Do you think in Tassie it's just AFL sport is pop culture? Yeah, that, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Maybe. There's some other things as well, but it's it, you're right, it was a hard question. Maybe just Area 52 yeah. or wearing oh. puffer jackets in winter. Yeah, yeah, stuff like that, definitely. Good job. <laughs> Do you have any thoughts about what Tasmanian pop culture might be? It's maybe Salamanca Market. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's a good Thank you so much, guys. Have a great afternoon. Yeah, yeah. So that was um, Taz Pop South and um, people dressed up. One of them was as Shrek and the other two from JoJo's Bizarre Adventures. Oh, were they? Yeah, I didn't think the... Oh, maybe the, the kid was dressed up. But I didn't think that the lady was dressed up. Yeah, she was dressed up as uh, Joseph Joestar. Okay. Joseph, which, I, which I only know because my son... Huge JoJo fan has got me watching them all. Oh, okay. And it paid off at that moment. Okay. Although, yeah, I didn't recognize that, but uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. So that's been uh, Media Mothership for another week on Edge Radio. You can find out more about us by going to Facebook and searching Media Mothership. But we'll post information there. We also have Instagram, uh, Media Mothership, where we post uh, great photos and pictures and images. And uh, you can watch us streaming uh, on Edge as well as Twitch and YouTube, all under the name Media Mothership. 
Mm. Yeah. Follow, Email subscribe, all that. Do all of it. So coming up next, we have Adrian with his fantastic musical show. And keep listening to Edge Radio. This has been Media Mothership with Dr. Craig and B.A. Zeke. Goodbye. For another week. Goodbye. Uh, coming up next is True Love by Howdy.